Would you stand up and help me welcome my friend Josh Roberts today? <laughs> Come on, Josh. <laughs> Good morning, you can be seated. How's everybody doing? Happy Father's Day. Can you turn around and give your dad some knuckles? Tell him you love him. My dad's here today. Thank you for all you've put into me. Thank you for uh, believing in me. I am who I am today because of you. I think it's important that you honor those that have placed significance in your life. Yes. Amen. Amen. You know, it doesn't have to be Father's Day to tell your dad you love him. That's right. Doesn't have to be Father's Day to honor those that have placed uh, significant deposits in your life. But I will take this opportunity since I'm in this house. Thank you, thank you, thank you uh, for your spiritual investment into me. Uh, you don't know this, but this was my pastor for many years when I was a teenager back in the Rock Dock. I spent quite a few years here running from God. And Kevin and Adrian were some, some significant influencers to help bring me back to the plan of God. I remember uh, crazy nights of worship back here in this rock dock yeah. where the presence of God showed up yeah, and, and grabbed a hold of a group of students that were hungry and that were crying out, didn't even know what we wanted, but he'll meet you where you are. And I thank yeah. you for creating that environment, for creating that place for students then and today, because... Uh, you are a spiritual father, and so I honor you for that today. Would you make some noise for your pastor today? I was thinking back today as I was driving home from the beach yesterday, all these crazy memories of youth ministry here at Harvest, and I'm, again, I'm just, it's crazy to stand on this stage. The last time I stood on the stage was in 1999. I was in my 20s, getting ready to move to Mexico, and God let me share the service that, that night and talk about our trip, and here we are 22 years later. Uh, I'm 45 years old now. I have three beautiful kids. I have an eight-month-old uh, eight Cash, as my daughter calls him, she calls him Cash Money. <laughs> She said, cash money, come here, get over here. And then I have a two-year-old, Emmy Ray Roberts, my daughter. And then I have a six-year-old son, Hunter, who is a buck wild, going to be a preacher of the gospel. Now, I'm blessed. I've been married eight years, uh, nine years this August. And I got to say this, you know, talk about the favor of God. I'm blessed because I've just chosen never to quit and never to give up. And my prayer for you today is that you get stirred in your heart, wherever you're at in life, that you would just pick yourself up and keep on moving. Yeah. You know, I think about people that I admire in my life weren't bottle rocket people. Yeah, yeah. You know, for whatever reason, we, we celebrate bottle rocket, flash of the pan kind of people. People that rose from the ashes and shot up high real quick and then poof. And we never hear from them again. Yeah. But the God's, I believe that God's calling individuals and families not to be flash-in-the-pan Christians, but people like your pastors that will stay faithful to the call no matter what's going on. God honors faithfulness. And all of us in our natural flesh want to be recognized in a moment, but God takes a lifetime to recognize people. And I pray today is that you would be encouraged and challenged. If you knew my story, you'd laugh. You'd say, who's this guy up there, this tattooed preacher? What in the heck is going on at Harvest Church? And I'll just say this to you. I'm no different than you are. I just chose to never quit and never give up. Amen. And I want to tell you this. Wherever you're at, whatever you're going through, as long as you'll get back up, God will meet you where you are. Amen. 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 I'm, um, I'm a family pastor at a great church in Boston, International Family Church. My pastors, Jonathan and Verna Del Turk, have been pastoring the same church for 40 years. We have over 60 nations that worship with us on a Sunday, about 1,700 in our auditorium on those weekends, with about 500 of them being kids. But we've built a culture of family at our church. And I want to tell you this, man, when, when you make room for families, God will show up. And I believe that's what he's doing here, but I bring blessings and Greetings from my pastor to you today. I want to share a scripture with you, and then I'll break the scripture down. But I want to um, share a scripture that I've been meditating on now for several weeks. You know, Joshua says, meditate on the word day and night. And when you do that, you'll have a successful life. Yeah, that's right. It's that simple. Meditate on the word. Spend time reading the word. Spend time quoting the word. Spend time studying the word. Invest the word in your life. And guess what, man? It's just like rocket science. You're going to show up and be a difference in somebody's life. Someone said, I want to be successful. I want to do this. Get in the word and find out who you are. Yeah. 
Now, y'all gonna have to help me. First service, they like to shout and cheer. I like, I like a little preaching. If y'all all right with that? I'm down south this morning. All the Boston folks, they're real quiet up there, and I was, I was kind of looking forward to being with y'all today. So, y'all help me out. I want to read this scripture out of Hebrews chapter 11, verse 7. I love the Amplified Translation. It says this. It says, by faith. Will you say that with me? By faith. By faith, Noah, with confidence in God and his word, Noah being warned of God about events not yet seen, in reverence he prepared an ark for the salvation of his family. And by this act of faith, this act of obedience, he condemned the world and became an heir of righteousness, which only comes by faith. Let me pray for you. Father, I thank you for each and every family that's represented in this house. Lord, I pray for those watching online and those that will listen to this or see this on Facebook later. Lord, I pray that your word penetrates their heart and unveils their destiny today. Yes. Lord, I pray that our ears are open, our, our eyes are open to see what you want to show us. Lord, we have receptive hearts to receive this word that you've given to us today. Lord, I thank you that you're the same today, yesterday. You're the same forever. You're never changing. You're the sure rock, the sure foundation for which we get to build our lives upon. And Lord, today I ask you to use me as an instrument. Use me as your mouthpiece. Give me boldness to declare every story, every scripture, and every word of encouragement for your people today, just as you place them in my heart. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Your pastor taught me when I was a student this acronym SOAP. Yeah. I don't know if you still use it. Take a scripture, find an observation, make it applicable, and then say a prayer. And I've used that to this day at 16, 17, 19, 25, 28, 35, 41, 45. When I read the Bible, I'm looking at scripture. And I'm looking to find an observation and how it applies in my life. And then I pray that thing over my life. Lord, I see what you're trying to show me here, and I'm going to do it, and I'm going to seal it with prayer. And today, I want to go through this scripture with you, and I want to show you how I've been praying this for my family, and for me as the father of the house. You know, today's Father's Day. It's, it's always funky on Father's Day, because you got a lot of people that aren't fathers, and they're like, I'll have to go to church. <laughs> but I want to tell you this. This message applies for anybody that calls themselves a son or daughter of God. You know, I realize we got lots of single moms that have been playing mom duty and dad duty. I pray for you today. Amen. Supernatural grace on your life. You're, you're equipped to do what he's called you to do in that house. Amen? Right. So let's look at this. He says, by faith, with confidence in God and his word. You know, you and I as believers were called to live one way, and that's by faith. I was preaching in California at this big, this big invitation, and I was pumped to preach. And I could see this guy on the front row, man. He just wasn't having it. He had his arms crossed, just ticked off at life, you know? Kind of had that impress me look. And he came up to me at the table afterwards where I was uh, talking to some people, and he said, I knew it. I knew he was one of them faith preachers, aren't you? And I said, man, I am. I don't know any other kind. Listen, when we preach the gospel, it's infused by faith. Yeah. It's lived out and walked out by faith, and that's how we succeed. It says that Noah, by faith, with confidence in God's word and what he said. Now, I don't know about you, but in Boston with this COVID junk going around, it's been crazy up there. Everybody freaking out. Everybody's listening to the media. Everybody's listening to their neighbor. Everybody knows somebody that had it, and so they're now an expert on it. <laughs> Y'all know any experts down here? <laughs> they don't have a doctor in front of their name. They're just social media experts. But there's been this season for the church as a whole where we need to make sure that we're anchored in what he said in his word. There's a lot of voices telling us how we should raise our kids. There's tons of voices telling us how to treat our wives, spend our money, don't spend your money. And if there's ever been a greater message than for the church today, it's the message that we live by faith. Amen. Yeah. But what does that mean? It means I trust what he said in the book. Yeah. Well, I don't understand it all. Neither do I, but I still trust it. Yeah. I still believe it. I still speak it, and I'm still going to walk that out. That's how Noah saved his family. Yeah. I'll just give you a little freebie right here at the beginning. The only way you're going to save your family from hell and all the condemnation that wants to come on you is through a life of faith. It's through a life of faith. 
It's first and foremost that we lead our families through faith. My wife was here in the first service. We've been married eight years, as I said. And when we first got married, we, you know, we didn't know how long it would be before we had kids. And did we want kids? And what kids were going to do to us? I was 36 thinking, maybe we don't need any kids. Maybe we missed that window. <laughs> we didn't miss that window. We got three. And just like you, I didn't know what to do raising kids. I didn't know how to be a dad. I didn't really know how to be a husband. But yeah, I went to the book and by faith, I began to say, hey, this is what the word says. This is how we should do that. And so we created a list of core values for our family. We call them family values. And the number one family value that we wrote down was we live by faith no matter what anybody else says. For the Roberts tribe, we're going to live by faith. We say it this way. We're bet the farm kind of people. That means we're willing to risk it all if we can find it in his word. And if God has spoken that to us, man, I trust that more than I trust Dave Ramsey with my finances. And I like Dave Ramsey. But when the Lord says so, I'm sowing by faith. I love this. You're talking about sowing a seed. My whole life has been a seed. When other people said, hold on to what you got, the Lord was saying, man, you should just give it away. When I left Southern California in 2014, we gave everything away including our cars, our furniture. We had nothing, and I was in debt. And people said, man, you're, you're, you're crazy. I mean, you should, yeah. you know, they got all their opinions on how you should live. And I said, well, that's not what the Lord told us to do. He said to, to sow it all, give it all away. Wow. And it was just a few months later that all of a sudden supernatural debt cancellation showed up in our life. Checks out of the middle of nowhere that people don't even know who we are. Checks started showing up at our house. And people would say, man, that's just, you know, that's just happenstance. No, that's the favor of God when you're obedient to live by faith. Oh, it's quiet in here now. You start talking about stuff, it gets quiet. We gave everything away. And it was two years later the Lord gave us a house. A house that we couldn't afford. God's faithfulness to you is a result of your faithfulness to him. I don't know why I said that, but somebody needs to hear that today. We're bet the farm kind of people. I don't raise my family based on social media practices. I'm not doing it based on what the neighbor said, what grandma did and granddaddy did. I'm going to raise my family. We're going to live by faith according to what he spoke to me in his word. Amen. Noah saved his family because he chose to live by faith. I love this statement that my pastor coined. His name is Jonathan Del Turco. He says it this way, faith is trusting God in his word no matter what any other information source may reveal. You know, every time I've tried to step out in faith, some other information source showed up to tell me why I shouldn't do it. Some knucklehead I ain't talked to in 10 years calls me and says, man, I was just thinking about you. Heard you getting ready to make some crazy move. Every time you're going to step out and obey God, another information source will show up and tell you why you shouldn't do it. And that's why we're anchored and focused in God's word. I was thinking about some of my times over the years. I've moved a ton, probably more than I wanted to move. But it was strategic on how God places you with certain people in certain churches and certain camps to pick things up. You know, I look back now, 21 years in full-time ministry, man, God's placed us all over the map. We've been to 20 nations together as a family. We've been a part of five church plants. It's been a crazy ride. But you know what? Every one of those steps of obedience, I pick something else up for the journey ahead. Every one of those steps, I pick something up for what God wanted to do in the next season. It was in 1999. I was living here in Mobile, and I had just actually come home from the mission field. I was living in Mexico. And I remember the Lord speaking to me and said, I want you to go to Tulsa, and I want you to go to this little mission school. And I was thinking, I just graduated Bible school. I don't want to go back to Tulsa. I hate Tulsa. I want to be here. I want to be with my family. I want to be with my friends. But I told the Lord on that beach in Mexico, he said, you go to Tulsa when you get home. I said, I'll go if that's what you want me to do. And I called my buddy who was coming home from Mobile and picked him up in New Orleans airport. It was actually Joey and Dustin. I was driving back from New Orleans, and they were saying, how was Mexico? And they had just come back from being with Kevin and Adrian in India. And I said, it was great, but I said, I'm headed to Tulsa in a few weeks. I'm going to go to Damata School of Missions. And Dustin said, I'm going with you. I think that sounds like what I'm supposed to do. 
And two weeks later, we were loading up my truck right here, and we were driving north to Tulsa. And I got to about Hattiesburg. And I looked at him and I said, why are we going to Tulsa again? And he said, we're going by faith, remember? We're going by faith. That's what the Lord told us to do. And I said, I know. I said, okay, you're right. Let's go. And we got to Memphis, Tennessee. And he looked at me and he said, why are we going to Tulsa again? I said, remember, dummy, we're going because it's what God told us to do. <laughs> and we got to Little Rock and we showed up in Tulsa late that night. Not really knowing why we were going, just knowing we were supposed to go. Now, Sunday morning, the next morning, I was sitting on the front row right here, and Pastor Mark Brzee began to preach, and this is what he declared. He said, this is a time of positioning and connections. And it was like bottle rockets went off inside my spirit, and I elbowed Dustin. I said, that's why we're here. He said, what's why we're here? I said, because God's going to position us and connect us with the plan for the future. Yeah. You know, little did I know that I would end up working at that church for two years, and that would be a seed out of there to go to Louisiana, then back to Texas, then California, all the way back to Mobile, and now back to Boston. It all started with an obedient step to say, I'm just going to live by faith. I met my wife there. The call of God was recognized there and, and, and fueled there. Amen. You say, why are you saying all that? Because there's somebody watching or listening today and you're thinking about doing something that you think God spoke to you about, but everybody else is telling you, be careful, don't do that, better watch out. You know, so-and-so tried that. And I'm here to tell you, you're not so-and-so. You are who you are. God has his hand on you. And whatever he's speaking to do, you better be obedient. There's a whole group of people waiting on you. When you realize the decisions that you make in life don't just affect you, you'll live differently. Noah made a decision to live by faith, to protect his family. Number one today, we're called to live by faith. Number two, Noah was warned by God about events not yet seen. A few weeks back, I was preaching to our church about the power of the Holy Spirit. And we've been in a 10-week series on discipleship and what does it mean to be a believer, but what does it really mean to be a disciple? You know, there's a vast difference between coming to church and worshiping God and just believing in God than there is to being a disciple and living like Jesus lived. There's a vast difference. And the truth is, every one of us are on a journey. That's the great thing about God's grace. Wherever you are at, he'll meet you there. Don't ever judge somebody because of where they're at and where you think they should be. You used to be that person too. Every one of us are on a journey towards discipleship. And it's not a race. Thankful for people that, that believed in me when I sat down and said, I'm not running anymore. I quit. I'm done with this church thing. Come on. Grateful for those people. So there's this difference between being a believer and a disciple. And one of the greatest differences is a believer loves God and needs the message of, of Jesus. But a disciple has embraced the power of the Holy Spirit. I wrote this for you today. Listen to this. The most important message to an unbeliever is Jesus, and the most important message to the believer is the Holy Spirit. There's something about getting saved, man. It's awesome. I remember being back here in youth group, having probably my first conversion. I was listening to a pastor. He's in my notes. I'm just going to wing it for a second. I was listening to this pastor, and he said, man, I'm, I'm 50-something years old. He said, I've had five conversions. I thought, that's the most heretic thing I've ever heard. You only get saved once. He said, yeah, I got saved once, but I was converted multiple times. He said, I remember coming down and giving my heart to the Lord at eight years old. And man, I went from death to life. He said, but I remember at 16 in a youth camp, giving my heart to the Lord again at the worship service and had a whole nother conversion again. He said that when I got married and had kids, he said, God did a work in me and I was converted with a greater passion for my family again. I want to tell you this, listen, the Holy Spirit is constantly converting us to be who we're called to be. Yeah. Noah was warned about these events to come by the Holy Spirit. A few years back, 20-something years ago, I was in this church and some of the ushers said, hey, we're going whitewater rafting. And I said, oh, I want to go whitewater rafting. And I was like 18, didn't know anything. I jumped in the van and we drove all the way to North Georgia to ride the Chattooga. Class four and five rapids, and we, we met the guy the next morning, and just being real, he didn't look like a real river rafting, river rafting guide. He looked like a hillbilly been sleeping in a tent. 
I was thinking we were going to go to this rafting place and they'd have all the rafts stacked and you'd get on the big bus and they'd hand you a blue life jacket and a yellow helmet. Not this crew. I don't even know that we had helmets. It was kind of like, hey, you're probably going to want to wear this. And I started freaking out. I was looking at him like, man, I don't know. And he could tell I was scared. He said, man, I'll just, I'll just give you some, some confidence. He said, I've run this river a thousand times. I've run it in the morning, I've run it in the afternoon, I've run it at nighttime, I've run it completely backwards, I've run it completely drunk. I said, what'd you say? He said, yeah, he said, I grew up on this river, man. I know every turn, I know every nook and cranny. He said, I know when the water's going to be high and I know when the water's going to be low. And if you want to make it off this river safely, just do what I tell you to do when I tell you to do it. And I said, yes, sir. He said, when I say row to the right, you row to the right. When I tell you to stop rowing, you stop rowing. He said, when I tell you to start rowing backwards, you start rowing backwards. He said, when I say, oh, and he cursed. He said, now you better get down in the boat, Jack. And I said, okay. <laughs> and I remember we went off the first set of falls. It was seven foot tall. It was a seven foot drop off. He said, everybody tuck in. We tucked in that, that taco, that boat tacoed in half. And I almost kissed the guy in the back of the boat. It unfolded. My eyes came out of my head and something happened to me. Adrenaline shot through my voice and I said, Yahoo! Let's go! I remember that because that's the exact way the Holy Spirit leads me to this day. Josh, if you'll shut up long enough, I'll tell you which way to turn. Josh, if you'll be quiet enough and just listen, I'll tell you when to paddle and I'll tell you when to rest. I'll tell you when to get in the boat and dug down. I will warn you of things to come because I'm the guide inside. And that's a word for some of you today. The Holy Spirit is your guide inside. It's time to shut off the noise and shut off the distractions and say, which way should I be paddling? Or should I be paddling at all? For so much of my life, I was trying to paddle the direction I wanted to, and it caused me to get stuck in a turbulent water zone where I just spun in circles. And maybe that's where you're at today. I remember being on that river and the boat just spinning in this circle. I thought, man, what are we doing? I thought we, were, I thought we was going that way. And the boat was spinning and I started freaking out. And the gentleman said, just hold still. I'm waiting for the water to settle. And then we'll shoot out through this gap. And we did. And we went through that next set. Maybe that's where you're at today. Maybe that's where you find yourself in your journey with the Lord it's just spinning. I don't feel like I'm going anywhere. I feel like I'm expending a lot of effort to make no progress. I want to tell you something. The Holy Ghost is working. I said the Holy Ghost is working even though you can't see it on the outside. I love you singing that song. He's the way maker. He sees it where there is no way. The Holy Spirit has been where you're going. His past is your future. And when we learn to, number one, live by faith and submit our lives to the Holy Spirit, we show up in the right place at the right time with the right people doing the right thing. I got to be honest with you. People ask me all the time, Josh, how'd you get to where you are? I just learned to flow with the Holy Ghost. What does that mean? It just means I get up every day and I submit my will to his. Lord, whatever you have for me today, I'm in. Lord, whoever you want me to talk to today, I'll talk to them. Lord, if you want me to shut up today, my lips are sealed. I'll shut up today. Lord, show me the scriptures you want me to study and read. Show, show me the people who I need to be running life with. I'm going to tell you this. Life isn't a paint by number. It's one of the hardest lessons I learned coming out of Mobile, Alabama, because I felt like I needed to be what everybody else wanted me to be. Right. Something happened when I left, and I realized I could be who I'm called to be. I remember the first time I went to Venice Beach, and on Sundays at 3 o'clock at Venice Beach, California, they have a drum circle, and it's rowdy. It's rowdy. I mean, it's 300 hippies dancing around with drum, drums, smoking dope, and hanging out. Man, they're having a time. They're having a blast. And I was standing there looking at this, and I'm thinking, I don't fit in. And some dude next to me noticed I didn't fit in, and he's like, hey, man, you want to play this drum? And I was like, I think I do want to play this drum. <laughs> I started playing that drum, and I'm dancing around, having a good time, and all of a sudden, for the first time in a long time, I was accepted for who I was. Come on now. Let me tell you something. You need to be who you're called to be, Amen. not some label that somebody else puts you on because that's who they think you should be. I remember telling people in 2009 that I was going to go start a church in a tattoo shop. And they laughed just like you did. T 
tattoo shop. Jesus, don't show up at a tattoo shop, man. Get those tattoo guys to come to church. I said, they're never going to come to your stinking church. It sucks. <laughs> and you know it. I hope we could say that here. <laughs> you know how much flack I got for wanting to take Jesus to a group of people who would never come to our church? I had more times with the Holy Spirit in a tattoo shop with, with a bunch of rowdy bikers because they were hungry and the thing that they didn't do was they didn't try to be somebody else. They were learning to flow with life and as they found the Lord, they began to change their habits, change their lifestyles. In the course of a year and a half, man, we saw dozens and dozens of men and women give their heart to the Lord in the middle of a tattoo shop. Amen. Let me just say this to you. Just, just, this isn't even in my notes. Some of you have ministries in your heart, but you're trying to put it in the box of what you've seen done before. Try to put it in the confines of what we've known before. But I'll tell you this, you, you're going to have to get outside the box to reach those that will never come to the box. Right. Love the food truck thing out front of the, the missions truck. I watch you guys do that and send that thing up and singing and dancing in their neighborhoods. Heck yes. Right. Yeah. Heck yes, they may never come here. Who cares? We're going to go to them. You didn't go to India to bring everybody back here into this house. We're taking Jesus out there. Yeah. Man, that something will happen with a group of believers who will be determined to say, you can't shut us up. And we're not going to fit into your system and do it the way that everybody else is doing it. I pray this prayer for my church. Lord, send us the worst. The prayer I pray for our church, Lord, send us the ones that nobody else wants. We'll take them. We'll love them. We we'll introduce them to Jesus in the power of the Holy Spirit. Yeah, but they're living in the same sex marriage. Who cares? You're living with your girlfriend. What's the difference? Well, they're tattooed. I mean, they can't come in here. They're smoking in the parking lot. Listen, we, we got it. Oh, man, I'm, I'm sorry. This, this, is, this, is, this is important that we understand. The Holy Ghost wants to flow through us to reach somebody else. It's not about you. The greatest revelation we can have as a believer, a disciple, it's not about us. It's about what he wants to do through us yeah. to reach somebody else. Amen. John 16, 13. <laughs> when the Holy Spirit comes, he will guide you into all truth. Yeah, he, will. he will declare things that are to come. I like to say it this way. He's the secret sauce in our life. One of the greatest things I love about Mobile, and I think the greatest thing to ever happen to Mobile, is Fusackley's chicken. <laughs> I got off the airplane last Saturday at 3 o'clock, and we said, straight down Schillinger Road, I know right where it's at, we're not going to, shut up kids, we're having chicken. <laughs> but you know what, it's just chicken until you dip it in that sauce. I'm telling you what, if you ain't had that sauce, you're missing half your salvation. Man, I was sticking my fingers in it. I was licking it up. I was like, can we get some more of the sauce? You know, I like ribs. I like pulled pork. I'm a pulled pork guy. And it's, it's important that you cook the pulled pork right, but man, it's all about the sauce. When you take that sandwich and it's falling apart and you're dunking it in that, the sauce is what makes it awesome. That's the Holy Spirit in our life. He's the secret sauce. He's the thing that separates us from everybody else. He's the reason we get up and have a little bit of spring in our step, a little bit of boldness in our voice. Now I got y'all with me. Listen, there ought to be something that differentiates us from everybody else. We're not called to be them. We're called to be us. And if nobody's told you this today, just be you. He created you with a purpose. And if you're willing to follow the Holy Spirit, he's going to lead you to your tribe. He's going to lead you to those that need him. But it's going to take us following the Holy Spirit. Thank you all for joining me today. <laughs> all right. By faith, with confidence in his word, Noah being warned about the events, not seen in reverence, he prepared an ark for the salvation of his family. Listen to this. Reverence means a deep respect for something. When you come to this house and your pastor preaches the word, he lays it out and sauces it up, man. I challenge you, come and receive it with reverence. Yeah, yeah. Come and
to receive it as if that's God speaking to me today. Come with your tablet ready to take notes. Come with a hungry heart. That's revering the, the importance of what he's saying. That's what Noah did. It says that he had reverence and preparation means this. It means to get things in order. Noah admired and had deep respect for not only what God told him, but the timing in which he told him to do it. So many people that I meet, they're waiting on timing. Oh, I'll do it when I get married. I'll do it when I have kids. I'll do that when I'm the boss one day. I'll do that when the kids are gone. I'll do that if we didn't have the house. I'll do that if we didn't have the truck. If we didn't have these bills, if we weren't married to these people. And what is it? We schedule our life around what we've created and the Holy Spirit said, I want you to take reverence for what I'm telling you to do right now in this season. Let me give you a little nugget here from my pastors. Life is made up of seasons. Everybody's looking for balance in their life. It's the number one question I get as a minister. How do you find balance with young know, ministry and kids? I'm an entrepreneur. How do you find balance with, you know, your businesses and your side hustle and, and ministry? I just want to tell you, balance is a myth. Yeah. You'll never find it. You'll, you'll start looking for it and you'll die looking for it. You're never going to find balance in your life because what God's called you to do isn't about a balancing act. It's about understanding seasons. Listen to this. Life is made up of seasons. Every season has an assignment. And every assignment is significant. So, good. Wow. so let me ask you this. What season are you in? What season of life are you in? And what's God speaking to you about this season? Because there's an assignment attached to the season. And some of us are praying for this season to go away. I wish that season would just end and a new season could come. And the Lord said, you can't leave the season until you finish your assignment. Every assignment is significant. I was thinking back now. You know, hindsight's always so awesome. Because <laughs> in the middle of things that really stink, you can complain and you can grumble your way through it. But you don't receive the blessing. Oh, I, I could just talk here for a minute. I remember unloading trucks for a church plant at 5 a.m., and guys around me grumbling, saying, this stinks, man. I wish I played guitar. I wish I was on the worship team. And I was unloading the chairs thinking somebody's going to sit in this chair and hear Jesus for the first time today. This is awesome. The willing and the obedient shall eat the good of the land. And I remember setting up for five years. Every Sunday that I had to get up and change my clothes, take a shower, and get up and do the announcements. And then as soon as we were done doing the announcements, I sat there and cheered the preacher on. I went back and put on my grubby clothes, backed the trucks up, and for the next four hours, I loaded that junk back up. I did it for five years. I'd never take any of it back in a heartbeat. You know what? There was a window for me and my crew that got to load those chairs. There was a slice of blessing, Pastor Mike, that only we got to receive. Because there came a day when we weren't setting up chairs anymore. We had been blessed with the building. Chairs are already set. And you know what happened? I found out, Lord, what's my next assignment? And I said, I'd love to watch some kids. If y'all need kids workers, I'll help with the kids. I'll help with the youth ministry. I came up under one of the best. I could do that. I know how to do that. Nice. Okay. You know, there's a blessing that's attached to a season, but you only get the blessing if you complete the assignment. Some of us are stuck saying, Lord, send the blessing. I need more. I want to be, I want this. I need that. And he's saying, hey, it's all in the timing. It could have taken you 10 minutes, but now it's taken you oh, yeah. 10 years. Look at the children of Israel. An 11-day walk. It took 40 years. I don't know who needs to hear this. I'm preaching to myself. Lord, help me to see and recognize the season that I'm in and help me to embrace the assignment so I can do what you've called me to do. I believe that's the cry of the Lord for us today. What season are you in? Where are you in that assignment? Stop praying for God to remove the assignment. And understand what you're supposed to learn through that. I believe that Noah was preparing because he knew there was a, a season and an assignment upon him to build this ark. He had great respect and because of that, he got his junk in order. I don't think I would have wanted to be Noah's sons. Having a good time and he says, hey, 
Better get those chainsaws fired up. We got some wood to cut, boys. But Dad, they're all hanging out. They're all going down here. It's spring break. It ain't spring break in this house. Make sure your chain's tight. Make sure your axe is sharp. We got some wood to cut. There was an urgency about him that caused him to become what I call the first doomsday prepper. You know doomsday preppers? They're those people that think the end of the world's coming, and so they need to stockpile all the resources they need now to make it then. Y'all are laughing because maybe some of us are those people. <laughs> I might have some ramen noodle in the case in the garage, I'm just saying. <laughs> so during COVID, my son wanted uh, noodles, you know, and I said, well, what, what, I don't want to fix ramen noodles. And my wife likes to make games out of everything, so I just in the garage, I went and got the noodles. I came in and I said, we're having apocalypse noodles! Apocalypse noodles! You know, because we're all locked down up there. We couldn't go anywhere. And so that becomes the thing now at our house. Can we have apocalypse noodles? <laughs> you know, I know lots of people, personal friends and family, that when you go in the garage, they've got the yellow tub stacked floor to ceiling with water, safety blankets, lighters, ammunition, firearms, fire extinguishers, fire helmets, fire masks. They got all stuff for fire like it's going to burn down or something. <laughs> and yet those same people have not prepared their hearts for what God wants to do in their lives spiritually. Yes. Society's telling you, go hunker down, hold on to what you got, put it in the can and sit on the can. Turn the news on. That's what they're saying. Turn on social media. It's hold on to you. Protect yours. Back off everybody else. But I believe what the Spirit of the Lord is saying to the church as a whole coming out of COVID is we're to have a different kind of preparation. My pastor asked me when the COVID started and we went into lockdown in Massachusetts and you really weren't supposed to leave your house or go anywhere. He said, let me ask you this. Who do you want to be on the other side of this pandemic? Because you need to make that decision now. For a lot of us, it was Cheetos and Netflix. And I did some of that, as you can tell. I like Cheetos and Netflix, but I got to tell you, there was a sense of urgency on us and our team that one day this thing is going to lift and then there's going to be a brand new assignment for the church. I don't know how it is here at Harvest Church, but we're rebuilding everything at our church. From the ground up, demolishing our youth ministry, changing our kids' ministry, revamping our worship ministry. Why? Because we know God wants to do something else. He wants to do something new. He wants to do something fresh. So it takes a group of believers like you and like me who say, I'm prepared. I've prepared my heart for what my assignment is next. I've prepared my spirit, man. He's charged and ready to go. I've prepared my physical body so I can actually get a bunch of stuff done. I prepared my mind to block out everything else that would try to keep me from my assignment. I believe it this way. The Lord's calling from some preppers, but some spiritual preppers. People that are prepared for days of glory like we ain't seen before. People that are prepared for the favor of God to be poured out in their life like this world has never seen. You'll only receive the favor and the blessing and the healing and the restoration and all those things you want to talk about if we're prepared. And our families are prepared and our churches are prepared. And our teams that we serve on are prepared. I truly believe, I truly, truly, truly believe that because of COVID, uh, we had a great disruption. Could y'all agree? Life was disrupted. You know, there's a difference between an interruption and a disruption, by the way. Because some of you say, my life was interrupted. And I heard this, people tell me, my life's been interrupted. I said, no, 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 honey, you, you, it's disrupted. See, an interruption is where we put a pause on doing things like we used to. And when the pause is over, we go back to doing things the way we used to. But a disruption is we're stopping what we're doing. And when we regain track, it's not going to look anything like we did before. That's a disruption. And for you and me as believers, we have to come out of this thing saying, Lord, we used to do it that way, but if you want to do something new in me, I'm prepared and ready to go. I believe there's a great disruption coming from many churches because they're trying to do church the way they did it pre-COVID. It ain't going to work. It's time for us to hear, what is it that you want us to do? What is it that you'd have us to do in the city? Show us something new that we didn't see before. And I pray that for you. That when you see this city, all of a sudden, the vision that you had before, it's great. 
But you see it with a new lens, a fresh perspective, and you'll say, that's been here this whole time. That was right under our fingernails. How come we didn't see it before? It's because your heart was adjusted and prepared, saying, Lord, here am I, use me. And if you want to use me differently, I'm cool with that too. And you'll have to be ready to support this. When the Lord begins to shift and new vision comes and new initiatives come, a church rallies behind their leader and says, I don't understand it, but man, I'm in. Amen. I don't understand it, Pastor Kevin. I knew you was kind of crazy. That seems really crazy. But for me and my house, we're in. Come on. Those that get the blessings are the ones that are tied into the vision. Amen. Man, I believe that for you. Amen. There's a new set of eyes coming that you're going to see ministry through a different lens. And you're a great man of vision. But it's going to be like superpower vision. It's going to be like, holy, whoa, Lord, I don't know if there's even time to do that. And he's going to say, well, I'm not talking about just in this time frame that you're thinking. Remember, we're living on eternity's timetable. What if the Lord is looking for a different group of preppers? What if he's moving past the procrastinators and looking for those that are active and ready? I got to be honest with you, I want to be on that front line of whatever God's doing. Yes. If you can't tell by now, I'm a risk taker. I love risk. I like to live right here on the edge of the line. If I think it's God, I'm going to do it. Yeah. If it smells like God, I think I'm just going to do it. Yeah. If it even feels like God, I think I'm just going to step out and do it. And guess what? He can always correct me. That's right. But I'd rather not live like this. Oh, R.T. Kendall says the, 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 the greatest, help me, Lord, R.T. Kendall says it this way. He says, a lot of times the greatest challenge to the next move of God was the last move of God. People stuck on how we used to do it. And now that's a divider and a wall separates a barrier for what God wants to do in the new season. I refuse to get stuck in a season. I moved to Boston for seasons. Southern California, we had four seasons. It was hot, hotter. This is stinking hot and holy smokes, it's smoking hot. <laughs> One of the greatest things I love about being in Boston is we have four full seasons. And you ain't got to be a rocket scientist to figure it out. When the leaves start changing, it's getting ready to get cold. And it gets cold. And it gets cold. It's actually pretty cold up there, guys. Did I mention it gets cold? <laughs> and there's a lot of people that get stuck in that cold season where we're at. But there is a season where it starts melting off and the trees start budding. And flowers start popping and the grass starts showing through again where you didn't see grass for six months but snow. And it's a reminder to me, God's got another season for us. And I put away the snow blower, I put away the shovels, and we get out the weed whacker and we begin to get ready. I challenge you as a church by the Holy Spirit. Prepare yourself for whatever it is that God wants to do next. Let me wrap this up, this final verse. By the act of obedience, he condemned the world. It says he became an heir of righteousness, which comes only by faith. Noah's belief in God was in direct contrast to the sin and disbelief that the rest of the world was involved with. By building an ark, he was taking a leap of faith, or you could say it this way, he was drawing a line in the sand. As Joshua said, for me and my house, we're going to serve the Lord. Y'all can do whatever you want out here, but I, I sense there's a change coming. There's a climate change coming. I can sense the, this, the atmosphere. It's, it's weird because it's never rained, but I believe Noah was out there with his finger in there and said, there's more moisture in the air than ever before. And he drew a line in the sand and said, kids, come here closely. Listen to what daddy's getting ready to tell you. There's a flood coming. And they're all going bye-bye, not us. So we're going to work hard to live by faith. We're going to be led by the Spirit of what to do, and we're going to prepare our hearts so that we can all be saved. Can I just say this to you parents, and maybe you won't like this, maybe you will, but, you know, I, I, don't, I don't really care what my kids think when it comes to the things of God. I'm really not asking for Hunter's opinion on whether he wants to go to children's church or not. I was raised with a dad who said, you're going to be on the front row every time the doors are open. I was here for men's breakfast. I was here for women's Bible studies. If that door was open, we were here. 
They didn't ask us, do you want to go see Pastor Kevin? Do you like Kevin? Is, is he a good youth pastor? Why do we ask our kids the dumbest questions when it comes to spiritual things? And we allow them to make decisions, but not natural things. I want to just tell you this, man. Your kids need to be here in this house, in church. For what? So they don't go to hell. <laughs> you know, it's important that they go to youth group even if they don't like it. It's important they go to youth camp even though they don't want to. It's important they come to VBS and participate even if they don't want to do it. Be the father, be the mother, not their friend. You know better. You've been warned about things that are coming. Well, Pastor Josh, I think you're being really tough. You know, they don't really like the youth pastor. You know, they don't like the youth ministry. You know, they went and this and that happened. Listen, they don't want to go to high school, but you make them go five days a week. We're so worried about higher education. What about spiritual formation? I'm not raising some kid that's just going to have a degree that hangs on the wall to work for an hourly rate anyways. I'm raising somebody that's going to hear the voice of God and go out and change the world. Your spiritual inheritance is directly connected to your faith. Let me finish with this. Thank you for letting me rant and rave for just a few minutes. I appreciate it. Judges chapter 6. Here's the responsibility that comes with this. Judges chapter 6. I'll wrap up with this. Thank you for listening to me today. It says, after Joshua dismissed the children of Israel, they went off to claim their allotted territories and take possession of the land. And the people worshiped God throughout the lifetime of Joshua and the time of the leaders who survived him. Leaders who had been in on all of God's work, all of his great work that he had done for Israel. And then Joshua, the son of Nun, the servant of God, he died. At 110, they buried him in his inherited lot. And in verse 10, it says, eventually the entire generation died and was buried and then another generation grew up and didn't know anything about God or the work he had done for Israel. Our greatest responsibility is to make sure that the message of faith gets passed on to those below us. The greatest responsibility I have is not as a preacher, but as a father, as a son of God, is to make sure that my boys encounter the presence of the Holy Spirit. That they have the opportunity to be in an environment where God will call them forward and yeah. acknowledge the gifts and talents on the inside of them. I'm grateful for this house again, and I'll wrap with this, because you led by faith when I was a student here. And I stand here today honored to say I'm continuing to live by faith because of the example that you both set. You taught us how to follow the Holy Spirit and hear God's voice above all the chaos. And it doesn't mean at times we heard other voices and we went down different rabbit trails, but we always came back to his voice being our guide. I've drawn a line in the sand for me and my family as you have. For us, we're moving forward. We're taking what belongs to us and it's an inheritance for our kids. And that goes for everybody in this house and everybody watching online today. There's a great responsibility that comes with being a follower of Jesus Christ. It takes the spotlight off of you and puts the responsibility on you. It puts the responsibility on you to make sure that everybody else around you knows Jesus, feels the love, feels accepted, feels welcome. You know, one of the greatest things that I love about being a follower of Christ in this season is I'm comfortable in my own skin, as you could tell. I'm done wearing masks to impress people that don't give a rip about my life anyways. I'm not posting on social media to impress you. I don't preach messages to get anybody else to like me. I just made a decision about six years ago, I'm just going to be me. And there's great freedom in that. But the greatest freedom is knowing I get to be me and do what God's called me to do for me and my house. And for many of us, it's time that we reclaim that back. We choose to live by faith and we follow the Holy Spirit that we draw some lines in the sand and take serious the assignments for the season. With your heads bowed and your eyes closed, I'd love to pray for you. Again, thank you. If you're new here, come back and hear Pastor Kevin. He's an amazing communicator. You're always going to be blessed in this house. 
I appreciate you receiving me today. I pray that you receive this word. Father, I thank you for these families, these men, these women, these children, these teenagers. Lord, I pray that today, above all days, that you would just remind them who they are. They're a child. They're a son of the Most High. And you've got a plan for them. You've got a purpose for them. Holy Spirit, steer them. Lead them. Direct them. Teach them. Be their comforter in crazy times. Father, I pray for the peace of God to rule and reign in each and every house. Lord, I pray for those that are confused, those that are distracted right now, that peace and clarity come right now in Jesus' name. Lord, I pray that those that are far from you would return home. Maybe that's you today. Maybe you're here today and say, man, I'm, I'm, this is good. I, I'm really not where you're talking about, man. I'm, I'm, I'm not there right now. Good news is God's right there. Whether you feel him or not, whether you feel like you're far from God or you feel like you're right next nestled up to him, he's the same, he's there. I'd love to give you an opportunity to make things right with God. So simple. It's the easiest thing I've ever done. And guess what? I do it on a, on a regular basis. Say, Lord, forgive me. I appreciate you sending Jesus to die for me. And today I choose again to follow you. If you're here today and you say, man, that's me. I need Jesus in my life. I need a fresh start. Would you do me a favor? I won't embarrass you. I won't call you. I would just throw your hand up, put it right back down. Say, pastor, pray for me. I need Jesus today. I, I've been doing my own thing. I've been making my own plans. I've been living by my choices. Maybe you're online today. Let us know in the chat box. Say, pray for me, pastor. I, I need that. Anybody at all today say, pray for me, pastor. I need Jesus in my life. I'm going to pray this prayer over it. That's you. Yes, ma'am. I see your hand. Anybody else? You say, pastor, pray for me. Thank you for your boldness. Can we just join this young lady? Maybe you've been here 10 years, 20 years. I'll just pray this together. Say, dear Heavenly Father. Just say it right out of your heart. Say, dear Heavenly Father. Thank you for the gift of Jesus. Thank you for giving him in his life to pay for my sins, my choices. Today, I declare Jesus was raised from the dead for me. And today, I choose you. Lord, today, in front of my friends, in front of my family, I declare you the Lord over my life. In Jesus' name, amen, amen. Thank you.